like to introduce Richard Hopkins, IBM Distinguished Engineer, who is going to clarify what computing, what quantum computing is and where it might be useful. And then i um, going to talk to you about how you can actually get a job in it. <laughs> I've got that right, haven't I? That is what you can talk about. That's what I'm going to talk about. At least that's what the title Excellent. says. So, right, I thank mean, you I'm... very much. I'll pass it over to you then, sir. Thank you. Thank ah. you for your help. No problem. Thanks, John. Um, so as, as it's a relatively small audience, um, it might be worthwhile taking questions as we go, um, because uh, as, as John was telling me earlier, he was on, he was on an IBM call uh, a few days ago um, about the latest set of announcements and, um, and our capability of using jargon to lose people. Um, is at another level compared to the rest of the computer industry because we don't even call programs programs. So um, please feel free to you know drop some uh, questions or whatever in the chat if you feel like it. Um, uh, you may be able to hear my voice isn't very good at the moment. I've got a bit of a cold, um, so I'm gonna I'll try and keep the talking to 45 minutes or so. Maybe it's, maybe it might go to an hour depending on. We've got a lot of material to go through. Um, but if we can keep the questions coming, um, then it'll make it more interactive and more interesting. So uh, I'm a uh, long-term IBMer. Uh, I've been in IBM over 30 years. Um, I'm a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering. Um, my background is large-scale complex systems integration programs and uh, delivery thereof. Um, so I'm relatively newbie to quantum computing. Uh, I've been involved in it for the last five years or so. Um, basically, since we put quantum computers uh, live on the cloud, on the web, um, that's kind of when I got engaged. So today what I'm going to go through is, first of all, a bit of a primer um, on quantum computing. So if you know that stuff, you might want to go off and make some tea or possibly have some tea um, for the next half an hour or so while I go through what quantum computing is and what is different. And then for the other half of the talk, I'm going to focus very much on what kind of skills are required, where that's going, and the kind of capabilities that are required um, to, to actually be part of the quantum kind of teams that we're building. Um, not just as IBM, but you know, as a as a as a nation. So let's let's start with the big picture view. Yeah, you know, we are. A small planet, but we have some pretty big problems to solve. And one of the great facets or one of the great hopes of quantum computing is it will allow us to tackle some of those kind of problems that, you know, at the moment appear to be pretty intractable. Uh, for example, at the moment, we spend about one and a half percent of the world's gas supply and a fair amount, quite a bit of the world's energy supply, uh, fixating nitrogen um, uh, to make fertilizer. I mean, it, it's the one thing that, that enables us to get from, you know, roughly 1.6 billion people on the planet at the beginning of the 20th century to about 6.1 billion people by the end of the 20th century. And, you know, we're now at about eight. So I'm, I'm continuing to go. So that process has been absolutely, uh, you know, vitally important to the human race. Um but actually, it's massively inefficient. It, uh, it, it the, 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 there's a couple of plants near me up here in Teesside, um, you know, that make the nitrogen for, for a lot of the UK. Um, when they go wrong, um, they're under high pressure and high temperature, and you really do know they've gone wrong because um, they make big bangs and things. Um, and it's not a very efficient process, which is odd, really, when you think about it, because this is precisely what plants do, and they tend to do it at room temperature. Uh, and they tend to do it without large pressure vessels. So, you know, maybe there's a way if we could actually understand how nitrogenase works, the enzyme that does this process naturally, you know, that we could actually start re-engineering some of the world's large industrial processes using quantum computing to, to simulate the, how the actual, you know, the low-level chemistry of those relatively simple molecules are actually working um, but as we'll go on for a moment, uh, you know, completely beyond the capability of, of today's technology to, to model. Or, you know, taking one step further, maybe catalysts to actually fixate carbon dioxide. That would be quite nice. That uh, might solve a few other problems. Or financial models, you know, that actually take into account more than just the immediate market conditions, 
take on board more dimensions of what's going on to improve the accuracy of of you know how much capital banks need to hold before they they're deemed to be stable or or, or or you know in in various different situations you know again these are difficult problems which at the moment we tend to make a lot of assumptions about or have to take shortcuts to be able to come to answers quantum computing has the potential um of starting to 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 change the way that we do those kind of things and finally, you know, things like new classes of antibiotics, you know, possibly the, the the most difficult of all these ones we're talking about, you know. So all of these things are problems that at the moment, because we find it very difficult to simulate complexity and nature or multi-body problems, if you like, in, in, a, in a very accurate way um, with a reasonable amount of compute resource, you know, these are the classes of problems that we're trying to look at with quantum computation. So the idea is to bring useful quantum computation to the world. It has to be recognized, though, especially given the recent headlines from China, um, uh, that people are trying to use the same technology to actually uh, undermine the cryptographic basis of how we do things like the Internet. Um, you know, public key cryptography is particularly uh, um, amenable, shall we say, to uh, uh, to to quantum attack now we think that's a long way off all right i mean it's not it's not something that we think is around the corner even if it was some of the headlines over the last few weeks uh, would su suggest otherwise um having said that um if you know there is data that is valuable to you now that is still going to be valuable to you in 20 or 30 years time uh and you're keeping it encrypted now and and to have that un unencrypted in 20 or 30 years time would still be difficult or, or tricky, um, then we really do have to start thinking about quantum safe cryptography and how we apply that to today's crown jewels. Um, because fundamentally, you know, although this technology is a long way away from being able to break RSA encryption, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, you know, the 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 chances of, of, of the world being able to do this in 20, 30 years time, um, is probably quite high now um, from from everything that we see, and I'll give you a flavour of why that is later on in the presentation. And this comes back to that original thesis that says, you know, some really difficult and tractable problems. You know, how do we address them? You know, Richard Feynman came up with the idea of of quantum computation in the first place, simply as a means of simulating nature of understanding nature at the quantum level, because he understood that as soon as you've got lots of you know, complex molecules or lots of elements within within a quantum program um, or within a quantum system, it, they form very complex relationships with each other that are almost impossible for current computational capabilities to actually model. Uh, and therefore, if you want to actually model uh, nature at any level of veracity, you're going to have to find some way uh, of bringing the quantum effects into the computer, um, which is obviously well, quantum computing comes in. You know, we have got very powerful computers in the world these days. They can do absolutely amazing things in terms of simulations and and the like. And you know, we've got Hartree in the UK, and, and you know, we've got some some great capabilities. But unfortunately, the nature is that there are still these these problems that are very difficult for those computational devices to solve and it's those that we think that quantum computing will be able to address and there may even be a class of problems that you know that we really haven't thought through yet because quantum computation is still relatively new there aren't that although there are lots of different names of different quantum computing algorithms there aren't fundamentally that many different types of quantum computing algorithms out there yet so there are probably classes of problems that we haven't even thought of yet that we'll be able to address um, with quantum computation. And, you know, coming back to our, you know, nitrogenase question and, and you know, if you look at a molecule like, uh, like caffeine, a relatively simple molecule, um, the amount of memory and compute power to, to accurately model uh, that molecule um, because of the exponential nature of complexity, the way that the, the complexity grows um, with the number of atoms in the molecule um, and bonds uh, means that, you know, the actual 
computational capability of the planet Earth is not really capable of dealing with that at the moment. But that's where quantum computation in qubits comes in, um, because we think that that kind of problem um, and understanding uh, things like the caffeine molecule at a almost you know a high level of fidelity without making assumptions and without making um, you know uh, on, on without without trying to take shortcuts if you like would be able to be done with 160 logical qubits, um, which again from reasons I'll explain later doesn't feel that far away anymore. Okay. So we've always, everybody in this call, given that it's a BCS call, I'm hoping knows what zeros and ones and bits are. Um, and, you know, the fact that we use and gates and, and, and logic gates to, to represent everything. Quantum's a little bit different. Okay, so quantum computing, we use qubits, um, you know, and, and they can be, each qubit can be in a state which is reasonably represented by the box sphere, which is any any for a coherent quant qubit on a, in a quantum computer, anywhere on the surface of that sphere um, is a reasonable state for that qubit to occupy. Um, so it's not quite as simple as saying it's in a zero state or a one state. Um, it can be anywhere in between and anywhere indeed on the surface of that sphere. So there's a little bit more information in a in a single qubit than there is in a normal bit. Um, and the actual circuits that we you know, we actually uh, create uh, to run quantum programs um, essentially, you know, use uh, a slightly different notation from what we're used to. Um, so here we have two qubits, qubit zero, qubit one. Um, they are connected through uh, logical uh, CNOT gates, um, which are the the little crosses and the and the lines, and then Hadamard gates. Um, and these are all sort of machine code level instructions that tell you how to manipulate an individual or multiple qubits um, on the surface of that sphere. Um, you might be doing rotations or you might be doing uh, two qubit gates where you're comparing one against the other to come up with a, a result. So that combination of ability to, to rotate the, 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 the qubits and that ability to have, have, have actually been able to do logical uh, conditional knots um, gives you the ability to create a create a, uh, a a general purpose computer. And again, this is you know one of the big challenges is how do you create a general purpose computer that can do the kind of algorithms we're looking at um, rather than you know simply using the quantum effects of nature um, to to perform closely analogous uh, computations. So sometimes you'll see people saying, oh, we've got huge number of qubits and we've entangled them all and we're getting amazing results out and we've, you know, measured the Gaussian distribution of boson atoms or whatever. Um, quite often they'll be, you know, those, those situations are all are using the actual fundamental nature of the uh, of, of a quantum effect within a controlled environment um, to, to model the situation. Whereas in this presentation, we're specifically talking about quantum computers that have got multi-qubit gates um, and the ability to conduct logic, etc. Okay. Oh, and on the right hand side, I should say, is the is the measurement piece. And this is just like Schrodinger's cap, you know, when you open the box, um, although the the actual qubits may have been in a very complicated state before you open the box, when you open the box, they will collapse down to either a zero or one state. So if you are building up a complex quantum state, on the left hand side, you know, um, when you measure it, it will be very simple again. So you may have to run the same circuit many, many, many times to get either a, an average result out or a or a probability distribution uh, function over many different uh, qubits to be able to extract the information or the answer out of the quantum computer. So, you know, as we just said, qubit state combination of zero and one states can be um, when you measure it, it always becomes a zero and one uh, based on probability. And, you know, here's one of those flipping examples. So we can go from the zero state to the one state by executing an X gate. And things like the Hadamard gate, which is the H gate that I showed you there before, actually takes it from the zero state or the one state and flips it to a place on the equator of, of block sphere. So, which means that you've then got 
a 50-50 chance when you measure that individual qubit of it being zero or one. And it's not the fact that it is either zero or one, it is both zero and one at the same time. You know, this is one of the nuances that we have to get used to when dealing with quantum computers. So how do quantum computers actually work? Well, how does it enable us to solve these very complicated problems? So at a very simple level, you know, we have, first of all, the, the factor of superposition. So we've already talked about the fact that the, the individual qubit can be in both the zero and the one state. But, um, and when measured, has to collapse down to the zero or the one. And that's fine, okay? But that's that doesn't really get us very far in terms of, you know, a any kind of combinatorial effect or ability to to use that for difficult or tricky salt uh, problems. So what is critical to quantum computation is the ability to actually entangle individual qubits. So on the left-hand side down at the bottom, you can actually see this is the layout of our of our um, uh, one of our old qubit chips. Um, and there are two, you can see the little lines connecting the actual individual qubits together. These are <coughs> essentially places where you can create entanglement within the quantum computer and start creating much more complex quantum states. And rather than it just being simply a, uh, a, a state that can be described um, as, a, as a mixture of the zero and the one state, it means that you get combinatorial combinations of dimensions um, that cannot be separated. So, for example, if we look at these two examples in the top right-hand corner, the top example, you can clearly see that the, the actual zero, the first qubit and the second qubit, which is the, the first qubit being the zero one, uh, and the second qubit being the one that's either in the zero or the uh, is in the zero and the one state. Yeah, um, they're essentially separable mathematically. You can actually state the, uh, the you can state the the value if you like or of the of the first qubit zero um, independently of the second qubit. Okay, so that is not an entangled state. The you can describe the first qubit without reference to the second qubit, but if you fire a microwave pulse and down to uh, these two qubits, uh, qubits four and eleven, just the right way, in a kind of a, a kind of think of it as a as a harmonic frequency, uh, you can make them entangled together, uh, and you can entangle them in such a way that you can no longer mathematically separate them. Okay, so that the state of the first qubit essentially determines the state of the second qubit. You can see that in in those entangled examples below, where you know, now the states are are fundamentally, you know, uh, intertwined between these two qubits. Now, that has an interesting mathematical effect, because basically, um, when you start adding more qubits into the dimensions, you end up with the combinatorial effect of all those different quantum states combining together with all their different individual probabilities. So the system could be in the zero zero state or the zero one or the one zero or the one one. Yeah? And that's only with two qubits. But as soon as you get into three qubits, then you can see that the number of potential states grows again. It doubles again. So one additional qubit doubles the number of potential states of the individual machine, as providing that they are they're entangled. And that has the exponential effect we're looking for. It means that by the time you get to 2 to the 10, you've got a very familiar number. But by the time you get to 2 to 127, or, you know, currently IBM's got a, a quantum chip with 433 qubits on it, then the numbers start looking incredibly large indeed. And it's that ability to model very complex, uh, multitudinous states simultaneously, which is where the power of the quantum computer comes in. You simply couldn't do that serially, or indeed, parallelly using the HPC paradigm, you know, you wouldn't have enough memory, you don't have enough processing power to be able to deal with all those states simultaneously and to model them. So, you know, by the time you get to 2, two to the power 275, there are more quantum states potentially in that quantum machine than there are atoms in the observable universe. Okay. Um, 2 to the power 433, I think I cal calculated the other day, was the number of atoms in the observable universe 
multiplied um, by the uh, the diameter of the universe uh, in uh, millimeters, I think. I mean, it was something outrageously large anyway. Um, and quantum computing is becoming real. I mean, it's it's it hasn't solved those world, real world problems yet. But you know, when you look at what's going on just in IBM alone, um, you know, we've now had nearly half a million users on our machines, separately registered, and we are running billions of those circuits per day. So a quantum program like a circuit, like the ones I showed you. You know, we are running billions of those per day for our clients as part of research or for academia. OK, um, and at the moment, we've got about 25 computers sitting there on the cloud. Some are free for people to use, as we'll see later. Um, some are chargeable, um, but fundamentally, it's drive helping drive a, a significant in, innovation area into quantum. And this is kind of what it looks like if you go onto the onto the actual IBM site. You can literally choose a quantum computer to uh, to to play with um, uh, and then upload your circuits and off you go. And, you know, the other thing that we're trying to do very much, you know, there's a lot of potential snake oil in the quantum space. Um, so what we're trying to do is be as open as we can about the capabilities of our machines. So, you know, every time you click on one of these machines, you will see what its latest capabilities are in terms of um, what its coherence is before it, uh, you know, how long the actual machine will will work in terms of uh, microseconds before it stops working um, and decoheres uh, most of the time. Um, you'll also things see see measure things like the gate fidelities and this kind of thing. These are all things that are being worked on actively across all the chips. Um, and which is why they, you know, they they tend not to stay. Uh, the results don't don't stay the same. Um, and we hope that by being open about these capabilities, um, we're hoping to ground the industry um, as we go. Having said that, you know, we have to also convince people we know what we're doing and we know where we're going. So very unusually for a research program, IBM has actually published not just a roadmap but a roadmap with a bunch of dates attached to it. Um, so you can actually see across the top, um, you know, the the years uh, when we're expecting to deliver these things or, or, or saying we're going to deliver these things. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And, and the actual technologies themselves. Now, um, so far, everything that's appeared on this roadmap, we've actually, you know, kind of, we've delivered, um, as we said. Um, which are those little green tick boxes. So currently the, the world's largest um, supercooled um, quantum computer um, is the Osprey with 433 qubits. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's the Osprey that's got the most coherent gate times and, and uh, sorry, the longest coherence or, or most, uh, most, uh, uh, most accurate gates. Um, that's back down to the Falcon and the Hummingbird where what we're doing is we're iterating um, multiple times on the same chipset to improve the gates and to improve the microwave uh, capabilities and, and various other elements of the of the quantum machines in a very iterative and agile kind of manner, and then feeding those lessons learned through into the later chipsets and this kind of thing. So you'll see that you know we're, we're aiming at Condor as being the largest chip um, for delivery this year. Um, but we don't really necessarily think that the chips are going to keep on just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, there's a lot of fundamental physical reasons why that doesn't really work. Um, so what we're moving instead towards is a much more modular architecture where we're going to find ways of connecting quantum devices together, um, uh, both in classical and in terms of uh, quantum ways, um, to enable the machines to scale so that basically you end up with a much more resilient and scalable architecture for how you're doing quantum. Um, does mean, as I'll show you, show you a bit later, that we've got some serious work to do around how we present that to the end programmer to make it easy for them to understand and use. Um, but fundamentally, you know, there's a lot of work going on about how we grow those quantum computers. In addition, uh, the, the nirvana of, of quantum computation always used to be regarded as being, well, these are noisy intermediate quantum devices 
you know, we need to get to logical qubits. How many logical qubits, how many qubits do you need to, to create a logical qubit? Well, you know, people have varying different opinions on that, but it's usually in the thousands. What we're beginning to understand now is we don't necessarily need logical qubits to make use of quantum computation and to get good results out that will be useful to the real world. So back to this kind of pragmatic approach we've got, we're actually looking now at error suppression and mitigation that's built into the chipsets, um, but also built into the uh, controlling software as steps along the way towards full error correction and logical qubits. And somewhere along that path, we think, will be sufficient compute capability wired together with sufficient coherence, with enough accurate multi-qubit gates and enough error suppression and mitigation to enable us to do real world solutions to some of those kind of, some of the earlier problems that we're talking about, probably in the, uh, in the optimization kind of space. And then there's layers on top of that. Um, this is all pretty much, you know, down at the, you know, can we build a physical quantum computer? Um, above that, there is also the ability to make it into something that people can actually use and play with. Um, so we're moving increasingly, you know, we've, we've always had our machines available in the cloud. Um, but frankly, it's been a little bit like being on a time served batch system. Not that IBM knows anything about those, of course. Um, but we need to get it to more of a serverless kind of cloud type model, traditional, you know, serverless cloud model would be a, an ideal way to consume quantum computation. To do that, we need to raise the abstraction level of how you interact with the quantum computer. So you'll find that there'll be, you know, um, archetypes of quantum circuits that do, you know, that either that estimation or the sampling kind of results at the end of them um, that will be prepackaged, you know, with, with algorithms and, and this kind of thing. So that basically, as far as the program is concerned, they're calling an algorithm with a set of, uh, with a set of parameters. Um, they will be unaware of the fact that that is then spread over multiple physical QPUs or the fact that error mitigation has been used to, to control that, the coherence of the system and this kind of thing. So serverless is, is, is the aim for how people will access this. And then even above that level of, of abstraction, if you like, of the algorithms for quantum, there's another layer above that where you know, there are already, as we've discussed, people who, who do molecular chemistry for a living and, and use existing Python toolkits to do that. So the idea is to also integrate quantum seamlessly into those existing open source toolkits and capabilities so that people who actually do, you know, uh, these kind of op difficult optimizations or Monte Carlo type simulations or... Uh, or, or, or molecular modeling of finding the you know the ground state of atoms or whatever you know of, of molecules rather um, you know they um, you know they will be able to use the existing libraries they they already do today without necessarily needing to understand a huge amount of quantum computing and this is an important message because this comes back to the the skills and how do you get a career and how do you work in quantum computing you can see that it's not a simple answer there's going to be lots of elements to it this is what Quantum System 2 looks like. We delivered Quantum System 1, what, a couple of years ago now? Um, there's, there's there's a few of them around the world um, outside of IBM's uh, ser server rooms. Um, the Fraunhofer Institute got one. Uh, Cleveland Clinic's got one. You know, there's, there's, there's four or five of them out there in total. Um, this is not really how we expect people to consume quantum computing. You know, the cloud model is, is, think, is we think is going to be dominant. Um, but to get to a modular system, we have to come up with a slightly different design for quantum system two. Um, and that's going to enable, you know, multiple quantum processor units to occupy the same cryostat, multiple cryostats. So a much more conventional, robust, resilient um, architecture for the for the quantum side of things, um, which you'd expect to find in a, in a machine room. And then alongside those things, very fast interconnects and close interconnects with conventional hardware to enable us to run these hybrid algorithms, which will allow us to get value out of quantum computation a lot earlier, out of a quantum system a lot earlier than we would do if we were trying to do things in a kind of purest way of just using the quantum computer on their own. Okay, so 
that's you know kind of where the technology is going so that's the first part of the the chat um i think i've just got done that in 30 minutes that's okay second bit may not take quite as long but let's 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 give it a go so what's the kind of skills and what's used to to be able to use quantum at the moment so the first thing to do is to you know the industry's been very very focused on building quantum computers and qpus and and this kind of thing and that's beginning to change um clearly there is still a lot of of stuff going on in the center around advancing quantum technologies and and this kind of thing but there's other stuff going on as well um places for quantum innovation you know in the uk we're now setting up our own quantum uh sense of competence and we've got places like hartree and this kind of thing uh, already working uh with simulators and and the like uh, and getting access to ibm quantum machines as well um and they're kind of building up the centers of excellence that are going to be required to to, to grow you know the, the capabilities at, at nation state kind of levels but then you've got the next wave, which is industry adoptions. So uh, you may have seen in the UK, for example, we announced HSBC as, as one of our first uh, adopters of the uh, quantum acceleration program that we're running. And what that's doing is, is helping them build up their quantum skills, but at the same time progressing specific quantum use cases within that capability. So it's not just as simple as saying, well, you know, this is how you do quantum and, and you know, let's show you some algorithms. It's actually working with them to, to find those uh, find those right opportunities for them to be able to, over a period of, you know, of three years or so, to be able to start getting to the point where they've got a proof of concept of a, of a working quantum algorithm, you know, that they can then think about deploying into the business. So, you know, that's relatively new you know up until this point the quantum industry has been relatively open i would say about sharing progress and sharing algorithms and everything else and we're beginning to see this next phase really of where people are starting to make proprietary investments um, on on things like the quantum acceleration programs and that's really really important why is it important to be doing that now well <laughs> uh frankly because at the moment um you know the skills chase the jobs, you know, so the people with the really good quantum skills want to be engaged in in clients and places where, um, you know, where this technology is being pushed forward. Um, and at the moment, it's kind of like a, a, a reasonably balanced marketplace, I would say, you know, there's a there's a good there's a reasonable availability of skills. And there's a reasonably reasonable number of, of, of relatively small number of, of organisations, though, even that's, you know, in the hundreds, I guess pushing the technology and, and the use cases forward that's going to change i mean clearly what's going to happen over the next few years is the number of companies that are using this stuff is going to get much much larger um and the skill supply probably isn't going to change that much which again is why you know talking about skills is really important um but also registering the fact that starting now is rather a good idea um, because you've got the ability to get hold of people you know i'm not sure in the next few years it's going to be quite so easy um and then we've got things like the application services themselves um there's an increasing market of people actually building um those uh, algorithms or specific use cases on top of um, things like kiskit which is ibm's um, toolkits for, for doing quantum computation uh, and then finally, you know, obviously the, the thing we talked about before, uh, the ability to uh, ensure that using quantum is not the same cryptography. <laughs> whoever's, whoever's blowing across the top of a bottle could they go on mute, please? There we go. So... You know the ability to to be quantum safe, um, quantum safe cryptography is 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 important, um, and you know the we're, we're working with some of the larger um, clients already um, in in surveying their landscapes and understanding how you know th this doesn't seem this hasn't happened very often you know in in the sense of having to change encryption schemes you know on mass like this. Um, hopefully, it won't happen again for a while, but. There's no guarantees. 
So what we're really looking for now is how to become much more cryptographically agile and how we get people to be able to change those algorithms in a much more dynamic way than they can at the moment, um, which I think is a, it's a, is a safer place to be. Because if you if you think about you know how intertwined um, encryption and cryptography is with things like the telecommunications industry, you know, and, and and mobile phones and all that kind of stuff, you can see why you know Vodafone and IBM and others are getting together to try start working our way through that whole stack um, to understand how to how to make that industry quantum safe, and that's a huge challenge you know and not likely to be realistically addressed until 6g but you know that's that's where things are so there's a lot going on and it's a lot more than just the the hardware and software anymore uh this was the slide this is the eye test slide but these are the people who are basically involved in the ibm quantum network you can see now it's a really good mix of people who are in industry in academia um, you know, a, a very broad set. Um, so, and, and you know, and it's good to see that the UK is beginning to pick up the pace on this. You know, we've been talking about this <laughs> with a whole variety of different stakeholders for quite some time with the UK. Um, and clearly, you know, STFC have started work um, and, and, and there's other things going on as well, obviously, you know, around the, the various different quantum centres around the UK. And it's good to see them going. Um and and good to see the investment going into different types of quantum technology. I mean, the UK is probably one of the well, probably is the leader, the world leader in quantum optics. Um, so you know, quantum photonics or photonic quantum computers, rather, you know, it's a natural place to be to be building up the capability in that. And also, you know, things like neutral atoms and and this kind of thing, which is another form of of, of super cool quantum computing. Um, you know, different from the way that IBM does it, you know, but these are all, you know, potentially useful and interesting technologies. Um, one thing you'll understand, you know, if you look at this area at any level of detail, is there's no such thing as a perfect quantum computing platform, you know, they've all got their, their respective weaknesses and strengths. Um, and different algorithms will probably work better on certain platforms for quite some time to come. Yeah, you know? so I think there's a lot of room in the quantum market for multiple different approaches. Uh, we're all learning from each other. Um, and, you know, there's no reason why the UK shouldn't be taking a lead in some of those areas like, you know, neutral atoms or um, or photonic quantum computers, um, especially as, you know, as the Chinese and the UK, uh, sorry, Chinese and the US have, you know, focused quite strongly on things like, you know, iron traps and, uh, and super cooled, um, uh, computers like uh, uh Jasmine and junctions like the IBM ones so so we we started off on the talk about talking about you know what so what's it so what's it you know why would we be looking at quantum computation and these are probably the first three areas that you're going to see quantum computation used for in anger um starting off on the left hand side where the analogy between you know or the metaphor if you like between what, what the quantum computer is doing physically and the and the thing it's trying to model is is as small as it possibly can be which is simulating quantum systems and therefore you know that's probably where you'll see the the very early industrial adoptions and and material science and this kind of thing um but artificial intelligence is looking very positive as well especially around classification um we've already got um some state-of-the-art results out of combining quantum computation with with uh, uh with traditional um uh, fraud detection algorithms for example so um well ir irrespective of whether you're using you know something like random forest or um or xg boost or something along those lines to do some you know fraud detection today um for in, in the in the payments processing market um if you actually combine that technology with a quantum computer into an ensemble algorithm, we've already seen that we can actually achieve better than state of the art capability, you know, using using that. Now, is that ready for prime time yet? Could you put every single visa transaction through a quantum computer? No, of course you can't, <laughs> you know, not even close. So although we're, we're seeing that capability arriving, you know, again, there's a gap between you know, being able to do it 
in a lab, you know, with with real data, by the way. So when we saw a state of the art with real data, um, but it's still not a technology you 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 know that it, that is going to be you know instantly out in the real world. Um, but it's showing extreme promise. And then finally, you know, the 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 the, the other side of things is is the is the prediction side of stuff. So things like Monte Carlo opt optimizations, again. Uh, not the same kind of speed ups we're seeing on the other two, but um, still quite promising in terms of, especially the ability to tackle much more complex uh, scenarios or distributions or, or you know or capabilities, um, modeling more complex scenarios than we would do normally. Uh, you know, and this gives you an idea of the broad range. Okay, so again, you know, when we come back to um, where is quantum going to be used pretty much every you know in a, in a pretty wide variety of places um so you know trading simulations um we've already seen um the classification accuracy for 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 payments so so safer payments than this kind of thing um and then we've got clients like mercedes benz using you know the left hand side there the, the, the material stuff to to try and op optimize how you know their batteries and things work, we've got Exxon Mobil looking at how they move LNG <laughs> around the planet. That seems to be relatively important these days. Um, you know, optimizing the supplies of LNG given what's going on in the world is a pretty important thing to do. And things like J.P. Morgan Chase. This is a really good example of of how the ecosystem has been working. Um, uh, basically, originally, uh, IBM published the Kiskit capabilities. Um, a Japanese university, can't remember which one, picked up the capabilities, augmented them. Uh, JP Morgan Chase then picked up those augmented capabilities and then applied them to the futures market. And then basically, we picked up what they did uh, and put it back into the original toolkit and, and closed the loop. And that kind of experimentation you know is going to go on you know for example the reason that the jp morgan chase one isn't some kind of closely guarded commercial secret is because you know they concluded at that stage that they required you know huge numbers of logical qubits to be able to attract their problems what's been interesting over the last year or so maybe it's a bit more than a year now is that they've they've come to the same conclusion that we've come to which is actually splitting the problem down using hybrid quantum computations and using error correction rather than you know logical qubits uh, means that the actual hardware required to start addressing these kind of problems is coming down by orders of magnitude so again you know very promising and finally possibly the most you know uh, outrageous uh, potential use but possibly one I'm amazed that we didn't think of originally actually was that you know CERN is obviously trying to understand the behavior of, of quantum particles um at uh, high energies um uh, a potential use in the future for quantum computation so the idea is that we are creating an ecosystem you know from from the bottom to the top where a developer can use conventional tools to use quantum capabilities but that doesn't you know answer the question about how do you get the job and what the skills and this kind of thing and the point is it's going to be a very broad uh remit i mean i'll, I'll i've got a slide coming up in a moment that, that shows some an even broader perspective than this but let's just given it's bcs let's just look at the software to begin with um so you know we've got the equivalent of kernel developers algorithm developers and model developers okay um and basically what's going on in the quantum space is that you know the number of people doing kernel development was very large it's getting it, and it still is quite large but it's becoming a very specialist kind of area you know the cuda type skills and the you know the, you know, the use for, for for gpus and this kind of thing um it's that kind of level of understanding and capability that's required um so it's not that number of people that's going to be doing that, relatively small opportunities. But then you get into the algorithm development and the SDKs and everything else, and that's quite a big open source community. You know, that many thousands of people in that. Um, clearly, uh, ability to get engaged in that kind of space um, as a developer, especially if you're in the Python or the C++ area, those are, you know, pretty, pretty broad. 
And then finally, the actual model developers themselves. So remember, <laughs> I just showed you the list of all those companies, um, and that's that's where we're starting from. You know, there's there's going to be an awful lot more than that, and most of them are going to want people to develop models. They're going to want to take existing business problems that are either too hard or too complicated to do today, and and use existing quantum algorithms from the SDKs to apply them to their problem. So there's going to be a very big upswing in the number of people that are required to do this last stage of the model development. Okay. And it's probably that area that, you know, ideally is where we should be aiming large number of people, because if we can get our industries to absorb quantum computation quickly um, and apply it quickly to their problems, you know, irrespective of whether we end up using photonic computers or, you know, neutral ions or, or, or neutral atoms or, or trapped ions or superconducting, you know, it really doesn't matter if we can apply them to those, those industrial problems. So this is kind of like my, my summary guide for the quantum career guide, if you like. Um, on the left-hand side, there is a bit of a bias, it has to be said, that you need to have a you know, a PhD, ideally, in one of those subjects on the left hand side, it really isn't true anymore. Okay, if you want to get involved in, in the research, that is definitely still the case. Okay, that uh, it's still a very hot area, you will need the PhD in one of those subjects to be involved in the research. But that's a tiny microcosm of what the industry is now. And there's a huge amount of stuff going on in both the hardware, the software, and in the industrial regimes that actually you know require people with much more normal skills uh, and just to give you an idea of those i mean on the hardware side you can see there's an awful lot of engineering still going on you know this is primarily now an engineering problem not a science problem yeah it's we we, we you know ibm as i showed you in that chart has got four or five different things running in parallel all of them engineering things that are running in parallel to help solve the scaling problem to, to enable us to have enough qubits running for a long enough coherence period, which we call the 100 by 100, so 100 qubits, 100 gates, in essence, to enable us to do something useful. Yeah, And those are, you know, all being tackled by that central, you know, well, not all being, but mostly being tackled by that central hardware piece. On the software side of things, there's hopefully techniques there that you will recognize and understand and already know. You know, these are all incredibly useful techniques for where the quantum industry is at the moment. Um, as I said, you know, we're moving from an environment where, where we've had single QPUs, quantum processor units, to multiple QPUs, and we need to hide that from the developer. So, you know, all the stuff around compilers and graphs and, and everything else, you know, as well as, you know, the, the high-level stuff like the DevOps and, and everything else, deeply important. And finally, on the industrial side of things, you know, this is where the, the large number of jobs will be, I think is applying and changing you know the the world over to being quantum safe but also quantum exploitative um you know in some ways it, it it's it's it, it 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 feels a little bit like the year 2000 thing not quite the same it's a bit more it's a bit more a bit more leisurely shall we say there's not quite there's not quite the same hard deadline as the year 2000 um but it's it feels like the same kind of thing there's going to be an awful lot of of work and thought and and innovation required around both you know the cryptography and how we implement uh, the quantum algorithms in industry. So um, that was an overview of of the kind of skills and the kind of things. How do you go about doing it? I mean, the good news is this is you know the twenty first century. Most of it's free and most of it's all out there and most of it's based on open source. So again, this is an IBM picture. The Qiskit capability is the actual thing that that enables people to to work with the quantum machines. Um, but all of this, everything on there, um, is is open source, um, and everything on there is amenable to people going in and going, oh, "I'm going to try my own thing." Um, even down to things like you know Quis Quiskit Terra. Quiskit Terra allows you to change the shape of the microwave pulses being fired. At the quantum computers okay so you don't just have the ability to to, to 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 play around with the top levels there's also the ability to play around the bottom levels as well so you know a very rich set of capabilities and you'll notice also by the way that his kits used 
across the board with a large number of different uh, uh, hardware providers now. And indeed, you can even use Kiskit um, to access the uh, the Amazon um, uh, quantum uh, capabilities as well now. And that was that was announced last year. So, you know, it's it's a real ecosystem that's developing. Um, but but learning Kiskit is probably a pretty safe bet, to be honest. Um, there are some amazingly good. I can't supply all these slides uh, at the end of the presentation, but what I will do is for these ones about the skills and the URLs and the links, I'll provide these to John. So if anybody wants the copy from John, um, you can get a copy and you can just click on the links and everything else. So there's a vast amount of of, of really very good um, uh, YouTube content out there now and tutorial content, and it's not trivial stuff um, that's out there anymore. It's 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 really very good. Um, so first of all, well, ooh, lovely bit of animation, right? So first of all, the Quizkit textbook. Um, this is probably the most important thing. Um, so there, it's basically based around Jupyter notebooks for those that are familiar with them from the data science space. So you you get to read the textbook, and then it gives you a worked example in the code, and then you can execute the code, and you can modify the example within the notebook and re-execute it again. So a very dynamic way of learning, a very productive way of self-learning, um, the Quizkit textbook. And then there are a whole variety of videos, tutorials, guides, and resources, um, which will essentially enable you, if you want to, to actually become certified in quantum computation using Kiskit. So uh, a formal certification with an exam and everything else, um, and the first developer certification that we were aware of that went out there. So again, you know, the skills you learn doing Kiskit, by the way, will be are broadly applicable and across across the, the you know, other quantum computation capabilities as well. Um, there is a YouTube channel, um, which is actually, uh, again, very good. Um, Every year, there's a there's a major new series of things. I mean, you know, you'll even see people like Peter Shaw um, on there um, doing doing parts of the courses and this kind of thing. So, you know, and Charlie Bennett, I think, is on there as well. Who's uh, so there's there's all kinds of you know really very useful content there. Uh, and finally, um, there is also uh, a kind of classroom capability uh, for people who are in academia who want to create the courses and actually want to get information out there into the heads of our students, which would be really nice if you could, please. That would be great. Um, you know, there, there are facilities there for you to start setting up your own uh, modules and, and courses and the like, in addition to what's on the textbook. Um, and this is just a summary of, of those things. Um, the other thing I would certainly encourage, if you've got, you know, um, if you've got people uh, that are, you know, in their, in their, teens or, uh, or or going through university or just coming out the other end. Um, there are things like summer schools that we run um, virtually, primarily. Not always, some of them are physical as well. Um, I would sincerely recommend getting, you know, for them to do some of this self-education first and then to get involved in those summer schools and the various challenges and everything else. Um, IBM and others, I'm sure, are doing talent spotting as a result of doing that kind of thing. And the 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 kind of mindset leap you have to make um to be able to uh, engage in this space and and solve problems is is very very significant um for someone of my age uh, believe me um uh, or or people of similar ages um whereas actually if if you've come at this relatively new um and all you know is a bit of python um and and you know you've got a bright fresh new mind um, they do seem to find it an awful lot easier than us old people. Um, so I sincerely recommend if you've got if you've got mentees or you've got people who who, uh, who are interested, um, please encourage them to start engaging in things like the summer schools and other things. It's by far the best way to get into the industry is to actually actively solve problems in teams, you know, and and uh, and, and engage uh, as opposed to just absorb. Yeah.